Esther Dyson, ICANN's first board chair from 1998 to 2000. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Esther, how would you characterize the U.S. government's relationship with ICANN during those early years? They were trying really hard to do the right thing, which was not to control it. That was the whole point, that there should be this self-generating, I like to call it immaculate conception body that came out of the internet to manage and govern the internet's own resources, but with a very light hand. At the same time, this was something that they de facto controlled and they had to give it to somebody and, you know, sort of like handing somebody a baby and, you know, maybe you should tell them the baby's name and where it came from. So they were trying to be non-directive, but at the same time helpful. And, and you said the, the intent was that they have a light touch. Did they in fact have a light touch? Yeah. I, I mean, there are a lot of other people who think not and think they were sleazily interfering and manipulating and, you know, they were there. Uh, so in, in my particular experience, I think it was Ira who first... Ira Magaziner. Yeah, who first asked me, would I be interested in doing this? Suppo it was one of these very delicate, suppose somebody created such a body and suppose just hypothetically you were asked to serve on it, would you be interested in doing that? And I said, yeah, sure, without quite realizing how important it would be. And then a month or two later, I got a call from somebody from IBM, as I recall, who asked, who told me that they had created this thing and that a lawyer called Joe Sims would be in touch if I was interested. So I wrote back to our magazine and said, is, is this for real or is this some kind of joke? It was, again, they were trying not to be, here's a letter from you know, some U.S. committee, but just like, if this thing got created, would you sit on the board? And of course, they had to do that much. They had to do something to make it happen, even though they didn't want to be the ones making it happen. And it, so, so Esther, the intent uh, on the part of the government was to, to create this thing and then pull back. Right, and they were working with the Europeans who were, you know, it just wasn't in their nature. The Europeans were much more dirigiste and the way the European board members got selected, as I understand, was somewhat different and they were much more, quote, you know, kind of regular, influential people. And then I have no idea who brought Jim Ryan and Ira, I'm sure, would know, but certainly no one was whispering in my ear telling me, and now you got to do, now this, now that. Uh, so there was no, no pressure? No. Again, I don't know. Joe Sims must have had many And Joe chats. Sims was an attorney who was doing, if I remember correctly, some pro bono work in the formation of this? Is yeah. that correct? Yeah, and again, I don't remember the details are over time. I'm sure it helped their practice. We didn't really have the budget. So in theory, we would... And over time, of course, we did get a cut of every domain name that's registered, but at this point... But between the time of the formation and when that happened, where did the money come from? Well, we had some small initial budget, and of course we were trying to get an agreement with Network Solutions to pay us, and I don't recall, but you know, there's a big difference between a tax or a commission or a fee or whatever, and of course they resisted and they resisted having anybody else come into the business and so forth. I mean, the USG is an interesting outfit and it does this overseas as well. At its best, it, it fosters liberty and freedom and democracy even if it doesn't control it. And it's, it's sort of hard to control something to create something that is supposed to be uncontrolled, if you like. So, you know, how do you go in and interfere with somebody's elections to help them have free elections? It's, there's always this kind of inherent contradiction. In the context of ICANN's relationship with Washington, you have said ICANN was an extremely powerful vacuum. Elaborate on that. What do you mean by that? It was a vacuum that protected, if you like, this, this function of managing the domain name system, and it kept it from people leaning in and interfering. And the danger, of course, was everyone wanted to rush in and fill the vacuum with their own particular interests. And the USG was trying to keep the vacuum secure and sealed. And what you're telling me is largely they were effective. Largely they were. 
Yeah, I mean, in the end, again, you had a lot of money flowing through, some of which stayed with ICANN and much of which went out into the pockets of the people whose business this was because there was an artificial shortage of domain names or TLDs. But without the artificial shortage, you had you would have had a mess. And so the whole thing is somewhat arbitrary. And that's why we regulate monopolies. And so the goal of ICANN was to regulate it, but at the same time, it was, in a sense, the beneficiary of the thing it was regulating. And But as I said earlier, the really important thing was governments couldn't use the domain name system. And there, I mean, certainly governments can censor things without using the domain name system, but by and large, we tried to keep it from being too much something that was controlled by governments and used as a weapon against people they didn't like. You've been quoted as saying that Ira Magazine, or the Clinton aide, was an idealist, quote unquote. What do you mean by that? He believed basically what I just told you I believe, which is that this thing should be it should be controlled, but not by special interests, but by the, the public interest, and it should be protected from special interests trying to twist it or control it to their own ends. Did you guys assign credibility? It sounds like you did. Did you guys assign credibility to the Clinton administration when it basically said, we, we will take hands off? I mean, did they have to prove to you that we're not going to try and control this. We want to give it birth and let it grow on its own. I certainly believed them. I mean, I, that doesn't mean everybody in Congress agreed. There were a lot of people, again, in Congress who thought, my God, the internet, we own it and we're giving it away to these dirty foreigners. So it's not that all of the USG agreed, but the bits that we worked with were genuinely trying to do what I think is the right thing, which is why I signed up for it in the first place. You mentioned Congress. In, in December of 2011, you testified before a, a Senate committee, and you said it is not the role of Congress to tell ICANN what to do, quote-unquote. Was that the way Congress saw it? No, or at least cer certainly many parts of the Congress did not. I would say probably half to two-thirds of Congress had no idea what the fuss was about. But of those who cared, some thought, geez, why are we giving this thing away? And then Certain other set thought, wow, you know, I love America. We really believe in freedom. We believe in the internet as a worldwide gift to the world and we should let it be worldwide and free and we're American and God bless. And that was pretty nice. Let me get your, uh, your reaction to this. I've, I've sat in on a number of, of hearings, congressional hearings over the years where ICANN has testified I had a personal sense that there was always a great deal of confusion on the Hill about ICANN's mission and its structure. Do you share that perception, or is that inaccurate on my part? It's, confusion may be both, like, if you don't pay any attention to something, are you confused or just completely not interested? But it ranged from real insight to confusion to indifference to... Is that like a bottling company or something? In your dealings with the Hill, was it difficult? I mean, when you testified or when you had interaction with people in either the Senate or on the House side, was it difficult to get through to them what the mission was and how the independence of ICANN was so important? Well, I would say it was difficult because it certainly didn't really get through. On the other hand, personally, you know, we, were, we were just trying to get this one or two things done. And we were very lucky because the person Network Solutions sent kind of dug his own hole, poured water in it, and jumped in. So we, we won that particular battle. And I wouldn't say it was because we enlightened Congress. It was just because we won that particular hearing. We were practical. We weren't trying to educate all of Congress. We were just trying to get enough of what we needed to build the governance structure for ICANN so it could operate effectively. 
Esther, even after you left your role as chair, yeah. you were an active part of the ICANN community. Over the years, when you look back as someone who has been involved in the community, what do you see as the most problematic periods in the relationship between ICANN and the USG? It wasn't so much the relationship between ICANN and the USG, it was the relationship between the different parts of the USG that wanted to keep it, wanted to end the contract and, and send ICANN on its you know, path to freedom. And I, I haven't been paying that much attention, but I did go to hear a speech that Ted Cruz gave just because I thought it would be interesting. And it was kind of, you could talk about Obamacare and Obamanet. You know, like it was, he used it as a punching bowl to express his distaste for Obama. You know, like, so it, it ended up being, yeah, political football in a sense between people who hated the Obama ad administration, which you know, really had very little to do with ICANN in the first place, other than to keep doing this thing of setting it free. I mean, I thought it was a little premature because we hadn't gotten quite the, the guarantees. You thought that of, transition was premature? Yeah, but in the end, it was the right way to go. The problematic stuff was between different parts of the government who used it as a political football rather than actually looking at the, the substantive issues around what it does and what it should be doing. From your point of observation, was there a clear and agreeable consensus with the various executive entities in the executive branch of the government between Commerce, for example, and DOD and so on. Was there a common, we're on the same page in terms of what this organization ought to be? More or less. I mean, there were, there were lots of internal battles around this thing or that thing, but the gulf between different parts of the U.S. was much smaller than the gulf between, say, the registries and the, the governments or something like that. You, your opinion, when I asked you to give me a broad consensus, you, you seem to have a pretty positive sentiment regarding an overall sort of view of the U.S. government and ICANN's relationship. Vince Cerf, whom you know, mm -hmm. the way he characterized the relationship is, is problematic and not very supportive. Sounds like you don't at all agree with that. Well, so I was not chairman while Vint was, and he may have asked for things, you know, uh, for help that he didn't get. So I'm seeing it from a much, I'm seeing it from the two years where I was most actively involved and a couple of years after that, where they created the thing, sent it on its way, had a contract that had, there was some notion of how the contract should end if certain conditions were met versus, hey, I'm hurting here because this is going on or that is going on, can't you help me? And you know, I really liked the USG sort of saying, no, we're, we're not supposed to help you because you're supposed to create yourself. And yes, it caused some of those financial problems I mentioned, but fundamentally, in a meta way, they had the right attitude towards it. How important was Magaziner personally toward the development of ICANN, both the model and getting it off the ground? He's your key overall designer, and, and Joe Sims is probably your key construction agent or something. Two of the main players that yeah. made it happen. Right. Would it have happened had Magaziner, because you had mentioned earlier, it was a sort of natural evolution of something that needed to occur. Would it have occurred if there had been somebody other than Magaziner? Without Ira, it probably would not have been as smooth. It might have taken a few more years and been a lot messier. Had Ira not kind of taken the initiative, I think you would have it probably would have ended up in the arms of the ITU or somebody like that and been extremely bureaucratic and slow. And I think, in a sense, Ira made something happen that might have evolved differently without him. Interesting. Esther Dyson, uh, ICANN Chair from 1998 to 2000, thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you. That was fun.